So it's, uh, it's going to be a case study, um, so a case study that you guys can learn from uh, and we can learn from you if you get in touch about any of these issues, um, don't hesitate. Um, the context is um, this organization called the National Center for Biotechnology Information, uh, which is part of the Library of Medicine, part of uh, National Institute of Health. Uh, it has been around, NCBI has been around for 30 years. Um, and it's the home of the uh, United States DNA uh, sequence database, uh, GenBank, uh, but also services like the BLAST services, which uh, allow you to compare sequences <coughs> against each other and uh, against a bunch of databases. Um, PubMed, which is um, something that anyone in the biomedical community uh, is uh, using on a daily basis. PubChem uh, and a bunch of uh, it's a long tail of other services that we have. And everything is growing exponentially at NCBI um, to the point where it, it's, it has gotten boring even uh, to like at every presentation you look at exponential slides uh, and it's not even uh, interesting anymore. But um, here's how, just an example of how GemBank, uh, which pre, uh, predates uh, even NCBI, uh, uh, grew in the 80s. Uh, exponential growth into tens of millions of bases. Um, and just to explain what I mean by bases, it's uh, organic chemistry, ACTG, uh, forming base pairs, forming your DNA. Uh, so 10 million bases in the 80s, gigabases in the, in the 90s, exponential growth even steeper. Um, and then it sort of uh, becomes linear, um, but that's only because we're switching uh, technologies uh, and people started doing um, whole genome sequencing uh, and again exponential growth. And then they started doing uh, sequencing of short reads, uh, really short sequences. And then we grew, grew up in, into the um, tens of petabytes, uh, ten, tens of petabases. Um, if you look at the, these particular three databases, you don't even see the other two. Uh, that's how big uh, the short read archive is. Um, you can only see on a, logarithmic scale, um, uh, and you guys understand the logarithmic scale. Here's another logarithmic, logarithmic scale of uh, how sequencing cost is dropping over the years, starting from uh, $1,000 per, um, uh, per megabase all the way down to uh, less than a penny. Uh, and here's Moore's law. Uh, so that gives you an idea, you know, Moore's law is exponential decay of cost, gives you an idea of how biotech is evolving even faster than tech. Um, and then we have a lot of data on, on, on disk and tape, uh, and we're looking into the cloud, um, um, sort of creative solutions of how we could actually leverage the cloud, um, get people to submit to the cloud and so on. But that's a separate topic. Um, I'll give you a few more metrics, such as daily users, um, and page views, and daily downloads, and so on. And, and I'll really focus on the topic of services and how we um, sort of NCBI, how does NCBI remain resilient in the face of, uh, of all these technological uh, changes and evolution. Um, and so as an engineer, <clears throat> the way I think about it, about what I do or what makes me tick on a daily basis is uh, building and, um, and sort of delivering these products and services of high quality and what makes me happy is see them used. Um, and so when we go about presenting such things, we don't, as engineers, we might be excited about the internals, but we don't really show the internals, we show the interface of the products. Uh, and we make a promise of um, some sort of quality, of high quality, and, and we're setting expectations when we do that. And the world has evolved, and the world expects this high quality and expects things to uh, things to just work. Um, so inevitably they do fail, uh, these services, uh, and we're gonna be fixing them. And the thing is, um, you know, but, uh, first of all, how much flaking is, is there gonna be? Uh, and, and second, how are we gonna be fixing them? Uh, we certainly don't wanna dive into machines and, uh, you know, the cowboy uh, way of uh, SSH in the machine and do a bunch of uh, fixing. Uh, we, we, we wanna adhere to some principles, and so for, for that flakiness, there is uh, service level agreements, which is basically a contract between the, the, the customer and the service provider. 
Um, and then for, for the rest of the practices, there's, there are principles such as immutability and, and automation. So hopefully not dive into machines. Um, and then we, when we go about building um, the, these products, uh, there's like, there, there are things that where we're adding value uh, from customer's perspective. And, and then there is the, uh, um, the rest is basically the cost of doing business, um, the cost of uh, meeting that high expectation that um, customers have. So um, at NCBI, we have a lot of projects uh, and we let developers um, take care of, uh, uh, of their stuff. So the flip side of that freedom is uh, that you end up with a lot of uh, uh, slightly different solutions. And for, in operations, they, they look like different animals, and there's a huge number of them. And there's all this uh, flakiness around um, causing all sorts of you know, fire situations here and there on the edges, and um, we're constantly busy with that. So at some point, we evaluated all of that, and although we have this uh, pretty good uptime for the core services, um, it, it's pretty expensive for us to be, um, to be doing things in this particular way, and we didn't have SLAs in between the services. So we made a business decision of taking all of that and basically collapse it, um, collapse the cost, amortize it, um, make some room in the budget for developing new things. And uh, at the bottom, there's enough room in the budget to actually um, grow a proper DevOps solution and you know, grow, grow a team around it and so on. Um, so that's what we started doing um, like a year, year back. And we already had a few things going on in, um, in terms of a DevOps pipeline. So, so basically what we said is the green layer um, is where you want to be and there's some previous things and everything else uh, that we want to sort of shift up and move up. Um, and providing all sorts of incentive and disincentive um, sort of structures and schemes in order for people to actually uh, do that over the years. Uh, it's not really realistic to fork shift everything, but by providing incentives such as, <clears throat> you know, for new applications, you want to be very quick in creating them. Um, just say what you want, um, attach a budget code so we know whom to charge at the end in terms of accounting. And then you get an application, it's already operated and it's monitored and all that. And it's the perfect application, hello world, um, with, uh, with testing and everything and you just start hacking on it and now you start breaking and you gotta update the tests and so on. Um, so this is what developers really like uh, on one hand and what we really like on the other hand is, is that we get to control how this is done and we could evolve this uh, infrastructure underneath. Um, and, and then we had a conceptual discussion around what, like uh, around services. Um, your service in the middle, you have some users, you have some dependencies and then they have their dependencies of their own, and you have maybe users that are automatic users, uh, and maybe they have their own users. So in the middle, you're also in the middle of this whole thing, um, and another view of this is there is the, the, the complex dependency graph, um, and then there is also your immediate neighbors, the, the guys that I showed, and, um, and you're participating in different routes, uh, so it can, it can get really complex. Uh, and then, what is a deployment? Um, a deployment traditionally at NCBI has been you, you deploy on top of the existing thing. Um, some people do it in various ways, but a um, good per percent of the population was doing that. And so when things break, um, you do a rollback by deploying the previous version if you have it around. Um, so that now you have to keep a repository of things and so on. And then things can get complex if you have you know, a bug fix, uh, you, you deploy and now what do, you, what do you do? You break something else, do you deploy the previous version? Of course, you gotta do a lot of testing. So QA uh, is an initiative that we started like 10 years ago uh, with, a, with a proper QA um, sort of staging environment where we test all sorts of things. And um, it has become a bottleneck for us in the sense that you can only test <clears throat> um, um, uh, 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 a final set of, uh, uh, of uh, combinations of, uh, of versions of services. You cannot really uh, do multiple um, uh, sets at the, at the same time where they, they don't overlap and, and it, it became a bottleneck for us. So um, a better practice uh, is blue-green deployment. 
red, black, whatever people call it, uh, you guys are familiar with it. Um, you're doing a test um, on a side, uh, so the two versions can coexist in that environment. And actually, you could do um, any number of, uh, of such uh, combinations, uh, unlimited. So um, blue-green is just a matter of you know, having the ability to kind of have um, this routing table available to you, where you switch from one version to another. Um, and then you could discard the previous version of your uh, application once you have the confidence to, um, that you no longer need it. Um, and then another version of this, of course, is the Canary deployment, which uh, gives you um, similar functionality, but now you could gradually shift the traffic from, other, from one version to another uh, by, by using, for example, weights in, in your routing table. Um, and then you are monitoring all of that. Uh, you could do it by humans monitoring, but you could also do the whole thing automatically by uh, uh, having some sort of calculating a canary score on, um, on metrics such as CPU and uh, memory and uh, latency and error rates and all sorts of things like that, and then calculate um, deviation from the previous version and automatically roll back uh, if, you're, uh, if you go beyond some, some threshold. Um, so um, then we, we started building the, the, this whole pipeline and, um, and talking about it. Um, and so the first thing is your called repo, uh, which essentially um, you, you can control how the called repositories look like, but in our case, we have a lot of uh, existing things. So we, it's just a given, it's what it is. And then uh, people are running some processes. So you're familiar with uh, how Heroku did it in, back in the day uh, with introducing proc file, which is essentially sort of the minimal possible way of, of describing our processes. And that's what we adopted, and we were really successful in a sense of uh, it, uh, easy to adopt. Uh, penetration was, was, was very easy. And then um, the other principle also by Heroku is this 12-factor uh, up uh, um, principle, or one of them, of uh, splitting your configuration from, from your code um, and, and allowing to um, basically deploy into uh, unlimited number of environments, including you could deploy your branches and so on. Um, and so we ask people to, to put their configurations into .env files, uh, which are uh, now you know, Docker supports and all that. Um, so these two uh, actually give you enough um, uh, to, to be deploying sort of simplistic applications, um, microservices, web apps, or whatever. Um, and then you need something more elaborate. Uh, so we introduced the, um, uh, what we call a deploy file, which is essentially equivalent to uh, a normal job spec, uh, so you guys are familiar with that. Um, and then all of that triggers CI. Uh, we're using TeamCity, um, the multiple official languages uh, and frameworks, and um, uh, of course you build and test and produce artifact and all that stuff. Uh, enforcing standards on the way, um, and then feedback to the user, but also statistics for ourselves. And then continuous delivery is essentially you have an existing situation, something in the service registry, um, and then um, something uh, in the routing table, and you, you're deploying a, a new version of this. And you start testing with whatever developer gave you. So it's a smoke test of some sort, maybe something more elaborate. Um, but here's um, something that I want you to guys, uh, guys to, to pay attention to, to this particular request overwrite uh, uh, feature, that conceptual feature, uh, which allows you to kind of say, uh, for this number of requests, uh, for purpose of testing, I want foo to mean something else. Foo is the other version of foo that I'm testing at the moment. And not only point directly to foo, but kind of point uh, through something else, uh, maybe it's a backend, maybe foo is a backend and you want it to test uh, from the front or something like that. And then if this breaks, um, then you shortcut here, you say you failed. Uh, but then if you succeed, what we call activation is essentially just a, uh, a simple um, anatomic operation uh, that's just a routing table update. And we do execute that smoke test again. Um, uh, sort of post-activation smoke test, and then we say we succeeded. Uh, and if it breaks, then it's a rollback, which is also just touch the routing table again. So um, feedback uh, is just in Slack and, and some links to logs and uh, gives you links to uh, how you could communicate with people that can help you. 
Um, and then on success, you get to see the thing. And we got all sorts of uh, stats out of, out of that as well. And then uh, what we call continuous deployment, that, that's essentially a term in the industry, but it's delivery plus activation in our case. And again, that per request override uh, feature uh, is important to us because we had uh, a lot of, uh, you know, over the years we have uh, uh, many applications that need to be tested together. So it might be, you know, pretty big applications that, are, uh, that need to be synchronized for the purpose of release. Uh, so they get uh, to independently um, deliver them in, in an environment and then um, independently you could, you could test them within some context, but then more elaborate tests can happen and then could be activated uh, at the same time. And then you could do any number of such things simultaneously um, so you're no longer bottlenecked. Uh, in your staging environment. If you produce very quickly, um, this allows you to uh, not be bottlenecked. And then uh, from, for the rest of the talk, I'm gonna talk about operations, uh, cluster scheduling, uh, service registry, service discovery, and monitoring. Uh, on the premises, uh, we have essentially whatever we have, it's organic growth of um, you know, people asking for machines and they deploy their stuff. It, it's something of the order of 4,000 machines and at least that many services. Uh, and then in the cloud, we started doing the traditional thing of uh, baking AMIs and uh, you know, one application per machine and auto-scaling groups and, and all of that. But then we realized that there is a better way to do it with cluster schedulers and not only better resource utilization, but also uh, this uniformity that we're looking for between the on-premises and in the cloud. Um, and then that allows us to also do faster deployments and faster auto-scaling and auto-healing. So we have four good, good reasons to, to go uh, with, uh, with cluster schedulers. And containers are part of that. Uh, when, you, when you talk about cluster schedulers, um, um, the idea of resource isolation is, uh, of course, uh, important. Um, and then portability, repeatability is what containers give you, uh, highly desired features. Um, however, this whole thing is evolving from, from what we see, um, and there's the Open Container Initiative that is sort of uh, covering milestones of standardization. In the meantime, Docker is the big guy, um, um, sort of, that people generally use. As much as you might like Rocket or something else, um, um, Docker was looked at from security perspective in our organization, and uh, um, you know, the runtime uh, is, uh, is a concern and so on. We, we have to be FISMA compliant, FISMA low, not a big deal, but, but still while that discussion is going on, um, we looked at other things uh, so we could be in business in the meantime. So Mesos Containerizer would do that uh, sort of, uh, they have their own runtime uh, and, and also Nomad with the exec driver. Um, so we chose Nomad. Um, Mainly for, because Nomad is um, <clears throat> extremely easy to, well, relatively easy to, to operate compared to the others. Um, you have a single binary, single process, and it's uh, easy to, to deal with. Um, and so when we talk about this isolation, uh, specifically with the context of the exec driver, um, there are three things, um, the control groups, namespaces, and file system. So for, for exec driver, they cover some of that. Uh, I'll talk about CPU in a moment. Um, they don't cover network or devices. Um, they don't cover namespaces. Um, and the file system is you get a truted environment, but uh, uh, not, no quotas or volumes. Um, and so for CPU, um, what we were sort of um, not 100% happy with is there is guaranteed shares, but um, we wanted limitation for the, um, uh, for the application so we could uh, reason about their performance and so on. Um, and so what we did is um, we just forked Nomad and we, we enforced that. Um, ideally, we would have both actually. Uh, so we have applications being limited, but then you let some systems jobs uh, go beyond the, the threshold, um, which is what Kubernetes does. Uh, and maybe Nomad uh, would evolve uh, um, in the meantime as well. Um, there's volumes is another topic, which is essentially if you have external um, file systems such as uh, S3, uh, in our case Panasas and NetApp as well. Um, you don't copy those things, uh, uh, they're large in volume, but also you kind of lose the, 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 the connection with the source if you want to update something. You don't link them because there's no symlinks and hard links 
uh, would not work. Uh, and so you basically uh, can do this with bind mounts, which is what we did. Um, and then another interesting thing is when you have fluent bar, um, supposedly isolated through uh, truth, um, the problem is that they could actually see their, each other's secrets. Uh, uh, if those secrets are, say, pointing to memory location um, uh, or to uh, an external volume, uh, they would actually be in the, um, uh, in the mount table. So um, basically, you need more than just truth. And, and so namespaces help you isolate. So that's what we did in our fork as well. Um, and then the other thing, um, when we say volume support, what we mean is um, so what we did is just labeled some machines and then uh, added constraints on the on the adjust spec side. Um, but you know volumes are not first class objects in in, in Nomad, so we would uh, like to see that uh, I suppose. Um, and so um, our whole fix is not that big. We are uh, in touch with uh, with Hashi guys to uh, sort of evolve the product. A um, couple other things that I can share is on the security side. Uh, TLS got, got fixed as of uh, 06, and I think ACLs got fixed uh, just uh, as of uh, 07, just a couple of days ago. Um, so we'll see how that works. Uh, I was going to report that you know they need to be. Uh, you know you need something between the user and Nomad. A um, couple of other things on the Terraform uh, Nomad provider. It'd be nice to for the Nomad provider to be checking the uh, the job spec rather than just the description. Uh, and a little bit of structure. So what you see on the on the right is uh, what kind of the desired structure, rather than just a string. Uh, what what it is now. Um, but that's minor stuff. Um, just nitpicking a little bit uh, to make make sure that product evolves. Um, other than that, we are going uh, forward with uh, with Nomad, and we have four good reasons to be happy with it. Um, you know, exact driver does work for us for the time being covers our use cases, it is known to scale, so uh, it'll scale for us. And the couple of uh, limitations, we, uh, that's not a deal breaker at all at this point. Um, Spark is something that we're interested um, in, but we haven't quite uh, done some any research on that yet. Uh, we know that it requires a special version of, Nomad requires a special version of Spark, and so if people are uh, working in this front, you could get in touch with us uh, and um, let us know how it's going. Another big question is, you know, what do you do with databases in general for cluster schedulers? Are we there yet? Um, or do we need a couple of years of uh, evolution and maturity? Um, also a big question, but not gonna talk about that. Um, I'll talk about service registry uh, and what it means in our case. Um, we have on the premises, um, very uh, uh, mature solution for service registry already uh, developed over the years, uh, in-house developed, um, feature full and all of that, but it makes some uh, underlying uh, assumptions um, that are not true in the cloud. Um, so we started looking into another solution rather than uh, re-engineer uh, the whole thing. Um, and so we were looking for products of various uh, um, types that could fit our requirements, and some people built a solution on top of Zookeeper initially. Um, and then we kind of looked at, it be belongs to a, a set of products that basically, that give you enough uh, primitives, but it's ultimately a do-it-yourself solution. Um, so we kind of discarded that idea. Something like Eureka uh, is a full um, you know, solution, but it's only AWS. And then cluster schedulers give you uh, a full solution, but you gotta use them. Uh, so for the time being, we cannot consider that. So the only product that actually is on the market from, from what we saw is, uh, is console, and it perfectly fit our requirements. Um, not only gives you the service ratio, but you know, the distributed health checks, uh, uh, the, the awareness of the data centers, uh, security, and, and, and good scale. Um, and so we went to production with it. And in our case, what we experienced um, was a bit of flakiness, um, um, in particular because our connection to AWS is actually a direct connect with, um, that was not properly SLA'd, and, and so it, we had a period of time when we had uh, issues. And the other thing, we didn't have a full mesh initially, so as soon as we connected all the console servers, 
all the flex flakiness uh, disappeared. Um, um, and then that's, there's another way to do it, is just use the enterprise version where they compensate for, uh, for not having a full mesh uh, by doing hub and spoke um, functionality, um, technical compensation. Um, and then in terms of scaling, uh, what we did is um, um, touch the, the rough multiplier, which is sort of obvious and it's in the dock, but also um, use stale consistency mode as much as possible. Uh, and it actually can be used in most of the cases. Um, ACLs uh, is another way to kind of limit the amount of, uh, of noise, um, basically data transfer and events um, uh, only uh, as can be sculpted by ACLs. And then uh, given that I think I skip one of the things that I wanted to say here, um, yeah, it's the enterprise uh, version has uh, uh, the no vaulting servers, so you could scale the, the servers linearly, and that's another way to scale it. Uh, we actually uh, not using those yet, but it's already pretty stable. And I was gonna say, uh, console is the brain of the whole operation. It's, it's where um, the, the status of things is. Um, it has been remarkably uh, stable component among other components in our infrastructure that we uh, developed in DevOps. Um, so, so we're happy with that. Uh, we only saw a couple of fire situations which were entirely due to our uh, uh, mistakes as operators. Uh, we quickly uh, relatively quickly uh, solve them within 20 minutes or so. Um, and then service discovery is the other topic which we consider as something different from service registry. Um, the way we think about it is it's a layer on top. Um, and um, in terms of our requirements, again, that per request overwrite that I talked about earlier, um, the traffic shifting, um, and then the whole legacy world and the new world uh, had to be done. And when you think about the whole effort, there's like two ways to do it. You could uh, basically migrate everything, which is unrealistic, or you could uh, essentially create a solution of some sort to kind of have a hybrid and then gradually move things over. Um, and that solution for us has been a, a product uh, called Linkerd by Buyant. Um, that basically covers all the all those use cases. And uh, in terms of um, what the product does, uh, maybe people have heard of uh, the, the the term service mesh. It has been talked about for the last year or so. Um, and so there's, uh, in fact, um, can we raise hands? Service mesh uh, awareness. Okay. Um, there's Linkerd. Uh, on one hand, there's Envoy on the other hand. How many people have heard of Envoy? Okay, how many people Linkerd? Okay, and, and maybe uh, people are using that. There's also Istio. Uh, there are also some, uh, uh, there are other proxies such as Traffic um, and um, Fabio um, that are sort of, they may evolve into uh, this service mesh thing. Uh, in general, the, the way they describe the service mesh is essentially full needs to talk to bar. You have some application code and you have some network to worry about. Um, and then, you know, historically we have things like fault control move to the TCP IP stack. Uh, so now we have um, SOA and microservices. Um, you have things to worry about such as uh, circuit breaking and retries. Uh, and so it makes sense to kind of push this down at least to a level of a library. Uh, but uh, some people argue all the way uh, outside and make it uh, basically part of the stack. Um, and there are reasons for that. If, if it's a library, you gotta maintain it. Um, you gotta push uh, updates onto applications. You gotta, you gotta do this for every language they have. So current solution is to generally have this as a sort of um, um, like a sidecar to the application or an agent on the machine. And this is how they depict it. Um, and then you get to kind of have a single pane of visibility onto um, the whole um, service mesh. You could do distributed tracing this way. If you don't have a solution for that, it's an excellent solution. If you do have, like we do, it'll complement your solution and be uh, sort of enrich it. And then um, those two use cases for uh, uh, per request override and, and, and switching the routing can be done by the service mesh. Um, the only product that does this right now, uh, this particular feature, the, um, the per request override is Linkerd. 
Um, so that's what we went with in production. Um, and here's our setup. Linkerd is a proxy, but it, it also has a, a name resolver, which could be uh, part of the proxy, or could be externalized. Um, and then the name resolver is what actually talks to your um, service registry or service registries. It can have multiple backends. And then when Foo needs to talk to Bar, um, it goes through the proxy. The proxy will ask uh, the namer. The namer would, uh, would, uh, uh, would, would uh, talk to your service registry. And now the proxy can, can proxy. Um, but then any subsequent requests uh, for Bar are, are going to be uh, already, uh, Linkerd is not going to ask because it already knows. The updates from the service registry, such as you know, you know, backends failing, service uh, uh, health checks, um, are going to be uh, propagated as knowledge all the way to Linkerd. But Linkerd has its own knowledge uh, because it does the proxying, so it knows which backends are slower than the others and so on. Uh, and it could do all that circuit breaking for you. Um, so um, the beauty of, of, of this is that you could hook multiple service registry. And, and, and so we've, we hooked our legacy system, um, uh, service discovery system. Uh, and now we could talk to legacy applications. So um, basically, anything can talk to anything. Um, a new application can talk to both new and old. And, and if it's a, an old application that is using uh, one of the supported protocols, then everything is basically covered out of the box. Um, and then there is another mode, because this is a, a Linkerd is a, a application level proxy. Um, actually, there's Linkerd TCP as well, which is sort of L3 level. Um, it is also evolving. It's written in Rust. Um, maybe um, uh, this whole thing would evolve further, but uh, you, could, you could do a lookup uh, followed by a, um, a service call. And actually, that happens to be the model that our legacy world had. Um, so um, a legacy application would basically do a lookup in the legacy system. Um, and so what we did is we took that library uh, for a couple of languages only, and we provided another backend for name or D. And now we just rebuild the application, and you're in business. And essentially, this covers 100% of our applications. Um, so it was there's sort of zero, uh, zero cost uh, migration from, uh, from an old world to a new world. Um, and now, of course, we depend on, uh, on, on Linkerd, um, uh, but that's um, for us to worry about as, as operators of that. Um, and then the way we did HTTP is essentially, um, hey, you know, who needs to talk to bar? Um, there is a URL, bar.linkerd.ncbi, or whatever the URL would be. Some sort of scheme that Linkerd now understands and, and knows that this is not you know, google.com, uh, uh, so no need to resolve it by DNS, but as the service uh, discovery. And, um, and the way we do that is uh, we wrap the applications when they go through CI, CD. Um, they're wrapped with the environment variables um, that basically uh, HTTP proxy and, and no proxy. Those are sort of de facto standard environment variables that um, um, the, uh, all, the, all the major request uh, HTTP libraries uh, are um, honoring. Um, and this means that applications don't even need to know that they're participating in this at all, um, um, this sort of service mesh thing. And the whole thing is recursive. Um, all the way down. Um, and there's another mod for it, linker to linker, which gives you um, certain benefits that you could upgrade protocols, for example, or uh, add encryption, maybe with Vault. Um, that's something that you could do by just uh, registering, essentially, the, uh, uh, the linkers rather than the applications themselves in the service registry. Uh, and so this gives you this, again, recursive architecture starting from the user web requests. They discover the edge by DNS, obviously, but then uh, it's all the way down to maybe it's, uh, maybe it's Mongo, maybe it's uh, Solar, maybe it's uh, whatever other database. In case of Solar, it's HTTP, so you could still apply this. In case of, say, SQL Server, uh, what we do at the moment is basically it's a lookup and, uh, and then followed by a service call. Um, and this whole Per request overwrite also works um, within this constant, um, complex um, sort of chain of calls and lookups, uh, just because Namerd and Linkerd understand the, the overrides. The overrides, it's essentially a delegation table um, um, sort of um, 
local DTAP is what it's called uh, that you pass around as a context. Um, and, uh, and that's a feature of Finagle that has been battle tested in, in Twitter and that's how they do it, but it could be done in other ways. So the way um, we introduce this is uh, we actually abstract away all of that. So technology uh, underneath, um, um, you know, you have multiple solutions, but uh, we hopefully will be still in business. Um, and then we've operated uh, LinkedIn for about a year, reached some scale of 5,000 requests per second on, on at the peaks, uh, and about 1,000 services, uh, both uh, new and legacy. It gives us a lot of metrics, um, and that brings me to um, monitoring, which is the final uh, uh, topic uh, of this case study. Um, we monitor every piece of infrastructure, including uh, monitoring itself. This is an old, AppLog is an old system that we had uh, developed uh, over the years, which is sort of um, started with application logging, but then it grew into a number of other things, such as uh, even analytics and stats and whatnot. Um, it, it is um, quite comprehensive on the, at, the same, uh, uh, at the same time, you look at, for example, Google Analytics, and it's, it's sort of a little bit better in some for certain things. So we started complementing this system with other things, uh, with other products. Uh, in case of Analytics, Google, but uh, in case of, say, um, uh, time series data, uh, something like InfluxDB is much better. Uh, uh, it's just the proper storage for such data. And what we like about the tick stack in particular is that it's nicely decoupled and it has all the um, sort of uh, nice interfaces um, between the pieces. So you could substitute pieces. We uh, substituted, we were using Grafana, for example, rather than Chronograph, which is, uh, you know, evolving at the moment. And then we're happy with uh, tools like Telegraph, which really has a lot of plugins, uh, more than 100. Um, and you could do things like gather console stats, uh, in stats D format, but if you want to, if you want to uh, get uh, metrics about the services, for example, you could do console ex exporter, and which basically queries the API of console and exports things in Prometheus format. Uh, same for Nomad, and similarly for Link LinkedIn, which uh, gives you a number of options. And we, what we're using is the InfluxDB line uh, uh, protocol um, API uh, to use Telegraph. And what we uh, say for, for, for NameRD, but for the, for the apps, uh, we told people to basically, you know, you could do a StatsD or expose Prometheus endpoint, uh, and then uh, for, for any custom metrics that you want. And then in terms of um, dashboards, we basically generate all these dashboards, and we think of dashboards as a service. Um, if you have an application um, that goes through CI, CD, you will get that dashboard. Uh, but you also will get it if you, um, it's not everything can go through CI, CD immediately. So uh, if you want a dashboard, declare uh, your service and its dependencies and its SLA and we give you a dashboard. So it's sort of an incentive um, to kind of extract the dependency graph uh, on one hand declaratively. On the other hand, we're looking at distributed tracing and we're pushing people to, to, to log and so we get a full picture by combining the, the two methods of declaration and observability. Um, and then another, another piece of the tick stack that I want to talk about is uh, capacitor which gives you this serial processing but also batch processing. It could go and fetch batches from uh, InfluxDB for example. And then it'll signal when, uh, uh, it'll alert you when, it, when there's no signal. Um, but also uh, has a lot of built-in actions and you could do your own. Um, so it can do a number of things for you, including auto-scaling services, um, uh, especially given that we have um, the service mesh. Uh, so we have a lot of things like uh, request per second, the speed of change of request per second, latency, error rates, and things like that. Um, so it's, um, it's a pretty good set of metrics, uh, much better than just CPU and, and memory, which uh, um, essentially we, we think of as sort of a derivative metric. Um, you, you get CPU because of something else. So, um, so that's important to kind of be able to feed those metrics into whatever is going to act on, uh, on the system for purpose of auto-scaling. Um, and then you could do the same for the cluster capacity. 
Um, and there, there, there are tools like Replicator that was, uh, people were talking about yesterday. Um, um, that's another solution. Um, they, they would probably have to evolve it a little bit to, to get, you know, to be able to uh, fit it with metrics rather than just CPU and memory, but uh, it's another alternative, obviously. Um, and then auto healing can be done the same way. You know, an application backend is, uh, for some reason, not in a good shape. You just kill it based on metrics and then let the, the, the scheduler, uh, you know, just uh, deploy another one. Uh, it's, it looks like uh, things are converging into some sort of solution around that. Uh, both uh, the AWS uh, application load balancer is sort of um, doing such things these days. Um, and then Nomad, as of uh, the last version, 0.6, uh, also has some, something on that. Um, and then uh, the point I'm making is that the, the service mesh would give you um, uh, sort of these additional metrics that you could feed into the system and, and actually uh, do the auto healing uh, in a way that's uh, a little bit more intelligent. And then at the end, um, there's all this auto healing, but uh, you've got to involve the humans when, when, when things uh, fail, alerts, and you know, create incidents in your incident tracking system. And then we could talk about SLA. Uh, finally, and uh, it's basically uh, the proper way of, of doing these uh, promises uh, about quality, uh, and you could define your tiers and you talk about multiple nines and so on. Um, so that's, um, that's our story of, uh, of how we decided to introduce um, all this uh, uh, quality among, between the services and, and introduce SLA and, 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 and contracts between the microservices within not only uh, the, the, the general core services of NCBI. Um, so if any of this is interesting, just uh, you know, get in touch with us, don't hesitate. Uh, and I appreciate that you came uh, uh, in this afternoon and, and listened to my talk. Thank you.